What is up, spooky season strangers? Yes. Welcome to another episode yes, 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 yes. of the Strange Sessions. The spooky sessions. The spooky sessions. As always, I am Kurt, your pilot of the airwaves, and I am joined by my co-host, lovely as she is talented. Am I the stewardess? You're the stewardess, the Sweet. flight attendant. I'm in Krista. charge of the drinks. How are you, Krista? I'm good. Well, we're both. Well, we're both kind of like. <laughs> I am getting. I am in the waning days of a cold, but I'm still pretty snotted up and, I have and a weird stuffed up. And pulse nasal Chris has got dread. a pulse, so we we decided this is the the snotty cellar down here today. <laughs> yep, the snotty session. So my voice might be a little shot today, but I'm sorry about that. But <sighs> what can we say? It is. I don't know how the temperature is where you guys are. But it is fall here. It is delightfully chilly. And it's chilly. funny because it literally was one morning outside school. The kids were complaining because it was too hot and humid. And the next morning they were complaining because it was too cold. And it's like in a span of one day. Yeah, it was in the mid 80s earlier this yeah. week. And then it yep. dropped down to the 50s. Yeah. Well, it was yeah, I think 40s one, one of on the, my way yeah, to work. Yeah, one of the mornings it was 40. I think 39 or 40. So, yep. oh, there's oh. Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy wanted to be on the podcast. Yeah, it is spooky season. It's fall, y'all. Nobody can be mad at me for being happy about fall because fall is actually here now. Yes. People get mad when it's like August and I'm like, ooh, fall's coming. <laughs> but it is technically fall. It's fall now. It's supposed to be kind of cool this week too, which is mm -hmm. nice. Next week, like 50s. But I stepped out this morning to go to my car and it's raining and it's mm -hmm. chilly and it's like, dang, this is this is autumn weather. Yeah, I love it. We might have a fire in the fireplace tonight. I hope in the fireplace. I hope it's not randomly throughout the house. <laughs> like the kitchen like whatever the, kitchen, the, the bathroom. bathroom would be a really yeah. odd place to have a fire <laughs> so what's up uh do we have oh again i will never remember this no we won't if you don't want to listen to this jabbering podcast. if you don't want to listen to the podcast just shut it <laughs> just off i guess shut it off <laughs> <laughs> no we're about to do some housekeeping welcome new strangers and a taste test if you don't care to listen to that check the show notes you can skip ahead to the uh, topic start time Kurt cool. will put a timestamp in there. I'm waiting One of these me. days we'll remember to say yeah. that right off the bat. I'm waiting for my DayQuil to kick in. <clears throat> Not the NyQuil. <laughs> Not the NyQuil. I texted Chris on the way down here that I had to have a shot of NyQuil before I got here, and then I correct. I'm like, wait, DayQuil, like, oh, not this NyQuil. This is going to be interesting. Yeah, it would be an interesting <laughs> podcast where I'm Kurt's on slurring, <laughs> falling asleep. <laughs> oh, shout outs to my, our newest strangers. I also told two of my students that I would give them a second shout out just because they're awesome, and oh. that's Nora and Paige Mitnacht. Uh, they're my little ghost hunting buddies that love this stuff. Nora said that she listened to the episode about the woods stories and oh, yeah. she got nightmares from it. Oh, so she sorry. might be taking a break. Yeah, sorry, Nora. <laughs> she might be taking a break from it. So shout outs to our newest strangers. And those are Lindsay Maves, Sarah Fee, Mika Chang, Josh Arthurs, who's returning. I, Cause oh, I got that. Yeah. yeah. I got that. I saw that. And I'm like, now I, I remember the name. I'm like, is that the same? It's old is that school. A, yeah. Is that like a different Josh? But then he wrote, no, that he had left Facebook for a while. So now he's back. So welcome nice. back, Josh. Welcome Good back, to have Josh. you back in the group. Robert Potter and Stephanie Blakey, who is a friend of mine. Uh, she talked about it like on oh, her yeah, thing yeah. where you have to answer the stuff. Mm -hmm. That a couple episodes ago, I talked about the band Pollen. That was like a mm. little known band from like Tempe, Arizona that I was obsessed with back in the day. And I met Stephanie on their message board and we became friends. And, you know, we sent each other mix CDs, which you did back in the days, mm -hmm, of course. Mm -hmm. But it's just I was thinking about it. And it's cool because it's like there are people that I've met online that you never talk to again. But then there's people that... You know, like Stephanie in Texas is another one that people that I've I've met online that are still like a part of my life and are my friends, even though I've never met them. Mm -hmm. And we maybe talk once every six months or something. And Stephanie is one of those people. So, And I love it that I just got a random message from her saying, hey, I knew nothing about this podcast. I'm listening to it. And I just absolutely love it. Oh, that's awesome. And she just got up to the Area 51 episode, so it's going to be a long time. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah. going to be a long time before she gets to her shout-out. But Stephanie, <laughs> love you a lot, and thank you so much for listening. Yeah. And that's my shout-outs. Um, oh, we got a postcard. Oh, and a letter. Hold on. Let me get my old lady glasses on. Oh, should we do housekeeping first? Sure. Yeah. Housekeeping. So many people like the episode with the wood stories. So did. thank you guys so much. Including I'm glad myself. you guys like that. Uh Linda, one of my friend's teachers at work, you know, kind of smacked me on the shoulder because I freaked her out. She was out cutting the lawn when she was listening to it and the flesh gate stuff. Oh, yeah. Totally creeped her out. So I got a little slap on the shoulder from her for sorry. Sorry, Linda. So sorry. Sorry. But uh, 
So I'm just glad everybody liked that episode. Yeah. And, and we were saying like when we were recording for the, the coffee subscribers that it's night or where, where, where were we even recording it? I'm not sure. I'm out of it today. I don't remember. <laughs> but, Are you uh, sure you didn't take NyQuil? <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure I didn't take NyQuil. Um, but we said it's just nice to know that like if there's a time that I can't do research for some reason that I can just... You know, I'm. I have, I have notepad upon notepad of creepy Reddit stories at home. Oh, that any time I find one that gives me a chill, I put it on there. So everybody a, loves a good creepy story, yes, you know. Yeah, and that leads up to the next thing, which is we've gotten a couple people that have asked if we could do more like classic haunting stories, like mm-hmm. ghost stuff. Which we started the podcast with the intention of doing that, but like I always say, I just feel like there's not enough. Even if we did one on the Stanley, I don't feel like there's enough to right. carry a whole episode. Mm-hmm. And I feel like they're your typical, oh, somebody saw a lady in white down this hallway. <laughs> somebody heard a thud. You know, I feel right. like there's not enough there. But Krista and I decided maybe next season, all of our mini mystery episodes will be about haunted locations. Yeah. Where Krista will pick one and I will pick one. Yeah, because like you said, there's not enough content to no, carry a whole episode. No, but I think episode. it's perfect for a mini mystery. Right. So I think we're going to put our our other like mini mysteries on the back burner for a little while. And then next season will be just strictly haunted areas or hauntings. Yeah. Like classic style hauntings. So I think people would be happy with that. I think so too. And the last one I have down is that we are fast approaching our season's listener stories episode. I believe that's going to be like two episodes three from now, three episodes from okay. now. So if you guys have any listener stories that you would like us to read on the air, please send them to us. Uh, you can send them a Facebook message to me if you want. You could call our lonely little phone line and leave a voicemail yeah, message. Yeah, we love would voicemails. Be awesome because we love yes. voicemails. Especially for that episode. Yes. Or you could email us. But we are starting to collect the listener stories for this season. Mm-hmm. So we'll be hitting mm-hmm. you guys up again in the next episode. But for now, if you have anything weird or spooky or mysterious that happened in your life, we would love to hear about it. I think I have a couple on Instagram that I have to remember to to read. Okay. So, But that's awesome. That's all I got for housekeeping. Cool. Let's uh, look at our mail. We just went totally Wisconsin when you said that. Look, look at, at our, our mail. mail eh? So this is uh, New York Tavern on the Green. I've heard of this. Yeah. Why have I heard of this? Okay. So hello, Kurt and Krista. Sending you love from New York City. Tavern on the Green has been featured uh, in numerous movies, including Ghostbusters, 1984. Stay strange, Shana Shalu. Thank you, Shana. That's your cousin, right? That's my cousin, yeah. Thanks, Shana. I love it. It's really cool. I love it. I want to visit all the places that she sent us postcards from. <laughs> she travel a lot? Yeah, she does. Okay. And who is this from? I believe Jennifer. Okay. It's it's an envelope with a lot of stuff in it. Let me crack it open. I, okay. Who knew I would need something to open an envelope? But hold on. Wow. We, we said we're having a rough day down here in the basement. <laughs> I have a hole in my jeans, too. So really... Uh, got my stuff together that's today. my problem at work is both my like jeans good jeans that i wear to work have a hole in the butt and i'm afraid to like bend over or do anything because it's gonna rip <laughs> you don't want to accidentally give them yeah a i'm show. guessing running around in middle school and my boxers wouldn't really be uh, appropriate appropriate yeah i'm gonna say no shoot i forgot oh to gosh. write down i forgot in my notes to put down our listener suggest song suggestions so i'm just gonna have to oh. grab those Did you super have quick some? yeah i had oh, two good. people actually sweet I believe Andy and Sophie. Andy and Sophie both sent one. Okay. So what is going on here? Ooh, I don't know what this is. Oh, Bigfoot Pocket Journal. Oh, Fun. that's cool. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. It's like a little notebook. This will have to go in our, if found, please contact. That's cute. This is awesome. I'll take a picture, and it came with um, some stickers. Thank you. And advice from a woodland. Is that a bookmark? Yeah, it's a bookmark. That's Find your cool. path, start from the ground up, stretch your limbs, branch out, <laughs> root for others, make room for new growth, recycle, recycle, recycle. I actually That's need cute. a bookmark. Well, here you go. You Perfect. Take this home. <gasps> thank you so much, Jennifer. Should we? Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. This is def. Oh, there's a letter. Hold on. I should probably read the letter. Oh, dang. Okay. Kurt and Krista just wanted to send you a few little things. I tried to find an Indiana postcard, but have had very little luck. I did come across this woodland bookmark while at the state fair. Reading it just made me think of you guys and the awesome strangers in our group. I can really see you using this with your students also, Kurt. Cool. By the way, the Dill Pickle Pizza won Best Fair Food this year, and it was well-deserved. Krista, your homemade take looked amazing, and we may have to try our own version. It was amazing. 
It did look amazing. <clears throat> I will say for someone who started this podcast not really liking pickles, I am like a pickle fiend now. Pickle pizza <laughs> is one of those things that is either going to be really good or yeah. just horrible. <laughs> I know? made it super garlicky. Oh, I so garlic-y. I think that, yeah, garlic and pickles to me is a great combination. Um, spent the last weekend of August in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan at the Paracon Conference. Oh, jelly. I would like to go to one of those, but I don't want to be like a, a vendor, a if that makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was the first time going to anything like this, and it was so amazing. Spent two days just wandering booths and meeting and talking to so many different people. So many interesting talks. MJ Dixon from England had an awesome talk on her England. Sorry, I'm terrible at reading this. On her England investigations, and the best was the John Tenney talk. I follow him on Instagram, too. He's he's kind of related to all the he's in the Hellier oh, movies yeah. yep. and uh, yep. he's he's friends with like uh, Kindred Spirits, oh. Amy Bruni yes. and Adam Barry. Um, OK, he was so down to earth and so funny. Best part was being able to chat with Dustin Perry about his experiences. He was from Ghost That's Hunters. Cool. Yeah. Everything in the UP <laughs> is all Bigfoot. So I picked up a couple stickers and a pocket field journal for your next hike out in the woods. I totally think you guys should think about going to a Paracon <laughs> as visitors. <laughs> ah, thank you. She knows us well. <laughs> she knows us. <laughs> it really is a neat experience. Keep up the great work and stay strange and amazing. Love. Well, I added the love. It's actually a smiley face. Jennifer. We're say love. Thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer. Yes, love you. you. Jennifer. So we'll have to put this up on our whiteboard. Uh, at, the par- at the Paranormal Conference, Krista will be presenting her Maura Murray stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and oh giving and God. steak and there will be steak burritos <laughs> yes. just in case you want yes to know. we'll have a food truck serving <laughs> steak burritos oh my god you know what's really funny is i researched for my mini mystery today how ha- so the mom there's a mom and a dad in this story yeah. and the, the beginning of the article there said her name was anita and like in the second half of the article they were calling her annette I'm like, what the heck? This is like the steak burrito thing. Yeah, that all is like the steak again. burrito thing. So I, I looked in a few other places. Her name was Annette, just so you know. Oh, I had one more housekeeping thing I forgot to put on oh, here. Okay. Before, if you are a coffee subscriber, before next weekend's side sessions, watch the movie Almost Famous if yes. you haven't watched it yet, because that is what the side sessions will be about. Uh, if you haven't if watched you haven't it, yet, seen what's it wrong yeah, with if you? you haven't seen it, there's two reasons to watch it. Number one, we're gonna be talking about it. Number two, it's one of the best movies ever made. It is. Especially I'm, if you're a music lover. Yeah, I'm actually I'll talk about it when we get to that episode. Anyway. Um <clears throat> I was also gonna just remind everybody we have another podcast we're starting called The Strange Sessions Book Club. So the Instagram is now live and uh we have an email address, the strange sessions book club at gmail.com. We're reading the seven and a half deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle. So if you're reading it, you want to participate, send your thoughts to the email address, or you could leave a voicemail too. Or send Krista what's going on in the book because she's having a yeah. hard time oh following it because she's I reading it before reading bed. reading it before bed, and I'm like, what's, <laughs> wait, what's going on? It's a complicated on? book. I'm so tired. It is a complicated. We should have maybe given them an easier book for the first one. I should buy the Cliff's Notes. <laughs> you should buy the Cliff's Notes. I think we'll all be really excited about the next book on the list, but we won't announce that until probably yeah. the next episode. So, But yeah, that is our new podcast. We'll also be introducing another podcast where we just talk about the weather for, <laughs> for an hour and a half, two hours. <laughs> yep. No, that's the strange session. Oh, that is the strange <laughs> session. Good point. All right. Jump into a taste jump? test. Oh, taste test. Wow. I forgot that we are doing a taste test. Okay. What do we got? <laughs> Something in the fridge oh, from... we were going to taste those gummies too. Remember we tasted one last week? Oh, yeah. Where I'll run they? up. I, they're upstairs. Yeah. I can run up and get them. And then I'll get what I'll get out whatever's in the... Yeah. Maybe bring down a cup because... We can use those mugs. Yeah. I don't know if we're, we should be sharing probably not. today. Yeah, probably both. not. Okay. I'll be right back. Okay. Yeah, these are the desert yep. assortment. Yep. I totally forgot gummies. about this. Um, okay, what do you want to do first? These? Let's do the gummy first. Okay. So last time I think what we did was the red prickly pear. Yes. Jim tried one. He tried one of the pomegranate ones. Let's do margarita today. Is that the green? Are you ready for a hardcore sugar? I'm ready for my sugar buzz. I could use it today. <clears throat> okay, let me take a picture. Very green. I'm not sure what she's got bubble wrapped so good, but there is it is glugging, so okay. it is a liquid. <laughs> it's glugging. It's okay. glugging. Okay, ready? Ready. Mmm. Mmm. That tastes like Christmas to me. 
Really? That reminds me of Christmas, and I don't know why. Hmm. It's very limey. Oh. Wow. For being so coated in sugar, it's not as sweet as I thought it was going to be. It, it totally reminds me oh. of Christmas, and I have no idea why. I don't know why either. Some repressed memory of something. Getting drunk on margaritas at Christmas? <laughs> Probably. This is really good. Yeah, it is really good. I, love I the like how much sugar these. is on there. Because mm-hmm. there's a ton of sugar, but it's not super sugary for some reason. Right. It adds like a really... It's it's literally got a crusty layer of sugar on yeah. the outside. Mm. They're really I like mm. chewy. Mm. Very limey. I'm giving that a 10. I think that's perfect. Mm-hmm. I do. I think it's I think it's just the right amount of sweetness. There are spider webs everywhere down here. <laughs> I'm just realizing. <laughs> but it's a spooky cellar, so mm. it's mm-hmm. it kind of has to be. Mm, that was really good. For someone who doesn't like stuff like that, that's really good. It's just like Krista. It's not overwhelming. It's just the right amount of sweetness. <laughs> <laughs> a little crusty on the a little outside. crusty on the outside. A little crusty on the outside. <laughs> mm, good stuff. Now. All right. We might need a welding tool to get. <laughs> I don't think you open things with a welding tool. You put things together with a welding tool. Oh. I am at school. I am watching a boy that kind of needs help with stuff. And I'm in a tech ed class and I'm trying to help people read rulers and I suck. <laughs> at, I'm, and I'm like helping people try to pound <clears throat> nails and use saws. And I'm so oh, fun. bad. I'm Jim not should good, do that. I'm not a good guy. I don't do guy things. <laughs> a dude. I'm not a dude. <laughs> you're not a, a dude car. What? I'm not a bro dude. Yeah. Except for that one reviewer. You can't carry a dude Except card. for the one reviewer that called me a frat boy. Oh, that's right. And I'm a giggly girl. You are kind of a giggly girl. <laughs> wow. You're getting a little taste of my pain trying to open that <laughs> bubble wrap there. It's like me trying to. Do you want the dagger? <laughs> Actually, yes. <laughs> oh my goodness! I have the bottom of a bottle. We're get, we're getting somewhere. Kurt. Yes. Okay. Oh, I've had this. Actually, last week I've had this. Did somebody just post about? Did Coleman post about this, or is that something different? That was something different. Okay. But I actually had this last week because I was in Pickens or in a festival foods and. I saw this. No, it was Pick and Save. I saw this by the register, and I'm like, oh, my God, I got to have this because this is one of my favorite ingredients. It is Sprecher, which is from Wisconsin. Yep. Sprecher maple root beer. Ooh, maple root beer. I love beer. Brittany Zahn, BDZ. Yeah, BDZ. We Snapchat each other anytime we find something maple because oh, we fun. both love maple. I do, too, actually. Oh, is that like a bottle opener situation, or is that a If it is, off? I got one on my keychain right here. Okay. But, yeah. Let me take a picture. I love, love, love it. I want to see what you think of it because I have, there is something that I feel about it. I want to see how you feel about it. I'm excited because I love this. It's so funny because I literally bought it a weekend ago, last weekend at the grocery store. So you pour it, I'll chug it out of the bottle. Okay. Thank you to our listener, Nicole, in Texas for giving me this bottle opener keychain that I actually use way more than I expected to. Nice. Well, thank you. I love root beer. I love maple. I, I love but I am too. very curious to see what you think of this because, like I said, I have an opinion about it. Have an opinion. And my opinion Sprecher is gonna makes be, really good soda. My opinion is going to be NMM. Nom? NMM. NMM. Um, yep. Ready? Is that Sam for not much maple? Needs more maple. Oh, it needs more maple. There's a hint of maple. Yeah, it's in the aftertaste. The maple is in the aftertaste, yep. but it's good. Like Sprecher. It is really good. If you've never, their root beer is if, really Yeah, good. if you've never had Sprecher root beer, Sprecher root beer, I see it like constantly ranked among the best like root beers mm-hmm. in the country. Do you, have you ever done the tour? Yeah. Yep. And you get to sample a bunch of soda at yeah. the end? Yep. Yum, I love this. Yeah, it's delicious. Nine out of ten because it needs more maple. Yep, I'm going to give it a nine out of ten too. I do love their root beer. Oh my God. That's good. That's so good. Nom nom. 
But yeah, the maple is only in the aftertaste. I mean, mm-hmm. load it up. Uh, yeah, because maple really complements like yes. all the yep. root beer flavors. I, I love absolutely anything maple flavored. Even those little like leaf cookies that are like maple cream cookies. Mm. I love those. I think I know what you're talking about. What time are we looking at? Uh, 26. But we had a good six minutes well, yeah, of we're right chatter. Right we're, right, we're actually right on the titillating 20. This is awesome that it's a mini mystery because I can shut up and listen to... Listen to Krista can read <laughs> and I can just <laughs> drink my root beer. Listen to Krista? Listen to Krista. <laughs> oh, I'm starting is what you're saying? I you think always I start. Do. That's true. Okay, let me bring up my stuff. Get to the top. This okay. Is, this is a mini mysteries episode, yeah. as you all know. Krista had no idea what mine was about. No, I have no. I saw the picture. I have mine no is idea. Ma- mine is sad. We're just gonna say that. Oh, great. Yeah. There's also a, Thanks, a, a there's also a deceased baby in it, which is depressing. Yeah, it but, is. And my whole thing Thanks is for my the heads whole up, thing. I guess my whole thing is depressing. So hopefully yours is more uplifting. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't call it <laughs> no, uplifting. No, because I know what you're but... talking about, so it's not really uplifting either. You know me. I tend to do missing person cases. Or cults. Or cults. <laughs> I, I did one cult, Kurt. Oh. It was a good episode, though. Everybody liked that one. Okay, you ready? I am covering the disappearance of Brandon Swanson. Let me put my glasses on. So most of this was taken from a post on, on medium.com under a subsection called The Shadow. And then I got additional theories from Reddit. So this is the article or post where... The mom was called Anita in the first half of the article and Annette in the second. Her name is Annette. Maybe maybe her name's Anita Annette. Maybe. I mean, they're sort of similar, I guess. Okay, so Brandon Swanson was born on January 30th, 1989 in Marshall, Minnesota, Minnesota, which is a small city located about three hours or 150 miles west and just slightly south of Minneapolis. The last census in 2010 is that the last census we've had? I thought we've had one. I thought more we had a 2020 had. census. I thought we did too. Well, this was written before then. Uh, the city had a population of just over 13,000, so that's a pretty small city. It is. That's how, like, that, how many are Man- in Manitowoc? Manitowoc is like 32,000, oh, so that's like half the size of Manitowoc yeah. or a little more. Brandon went missing on May 14th, 2008 when he was just 19 years old. So after graduating from Marshall High School in 2007, Brandon, yep, your mic's on, Kurt. <laughs> sure, so I didn't think I thought, you'd, I thought you'd be reading and you wouldn't see that. I have peripheral vision. Uh, obviously, you do. Uh, after it. graduating from Marshall High School in 2007, Brandon was attending school at Minnesota West Community and Technical College. Classes ended on May 13th, and to celebrate the end of the semester, he went out with some friends from school. The night started at a party at Lind, or in Lind, a small town located about seven miles to the southwest of his home in Marshall. He later left Lind and headed 35 miles northwest to Canby, a drive that should have taken about 35 to 40 minutes. He said goodbye to his friends sometime after midnight and headed home. Since this is where he grew up, Brandon was extremely familiar with the 30-mile drive from Canby to Marshall, and he drove it almost every day. The two towns are directly connected by State Highway 68, so not only were there no turns for him to make, there was usually very little traffic, especially at, I just said especially. Oh, I was just going to call you out on that. I wow. hit, ooh, That's one of my pet peeves. Me too. I was just going to call you out on that. I don't know why I even did that. I don't know either, Oof. but I was literally just Recover. opening my mouth to call Recover. you out. Recover. <laughs> there was usually, I'm blaming it on the post-nasal drip. <laughs> there was usually very little traffic, especially at that hour. Wow. On his way home, Brandon drove his Chevy Lumina off the road, getting stuck in a ditch. After trying to get the car back out of the ditch by himself and failing, and after attempting to call all of his friends, none of whom answered, great friends, uh-huh. he finally, it, it was after midnight. Oh, but that's, like, that's like me after 7 p.m. I'm, I'm asleep luck. like four or five hours <laughs> by say, then. Good luck getting <laughs> I wouldn't have been at the party in the first place. Who am I kidding? <laughs> he finally called his parents at 1.54 a.m., stating what had happened but that he wasn't hurt there was no damage to the car he just needed help getting it out of the ditch brandon's parents brian and anita it says anita right here i didn't change it brian and annette swanson told their son that they would leave right away so brandon gave them directions to where he was waiting with the car which he estimated was midway between lind and marshall going by what he told them brian believed that he knew exactly where they needed to go which was only about 10 minutes from their home A short time later, Brian and Annette arrived at the location they believed Brandon had described, but they were unable to see him or his car. They called him on his cell phone and told him to keep an eye out for them. 
After a couple of minutes, they started honking their horn and flashing their headlights, hoping that Brandon would be able to hear or see them, but he could not. They questioned if Brandon had directed them to the correct location, but he was certain that he had. So they asked him to start yeah, flashing I his this. headlights. This, this was a big thing. I remember this part. I don't remember this story. I do. They asked him to start flashing his headlights. Through the phone, they could actually hear him like turning his headlights on and off, like the clicking noise, but they could not see it anywhere. They were surrounded by wide open fields with no obstruction, so if he was on that road, they should have been able to see him. So Brian and Annette remained on the phone with Brandon the entire time they were searching for him, and he was starting to get aggravated. He was sure he had accurately described his location to his parents, and he couldn't understand why they were unable to follow his directions. They insisted that they were exactly where Brandon had told them to go, but Brandon was certain that they were the ones who were confused. Finally, his frustration reached a boiling point, and he hung up on his mother. She called him right back and apologized. Given the situation, his frustration was understandable. Though Brandon had initially thought it would be best for him to stay with his stranded car, he was convinced his parents had somehow ended up in the wrong area and weren't going to be able to find him. No matter how many times he repeated the directions, they didn't seem to understand. So tired of waiting, he decided things would go quicker if he could just get to wherever his parents were. Dun, dun, dun. I like, remember. Worst decision I, ever. I remember seeing like dumb theories. I mean, I'm the first one that'll jump on a parallel universe theory or a glitch in time theory, but <laughs> mm-hmm. I've seen people actually. I didn't come. I didn't run across any like that. This, and I'm like, no, this is. We'll uh, get to Occam's the razor. Oh, oh, I just yeah. Kristen. No, that's true. The simplest explanation yeah. is probably the most. Unless, unless I'm thinking that this parallel dimensions or we're a computer simulation, <laughs> yeah. then that's correct. Uh, tired of waiting. Oh, yep. So he could see lights in the distance coming from what he assumed was Lind. So he told his parents it would be easier for him to just walk to the town. He told his parents to meet him in the parking lot of a specific bar. Brian agreed. He dropped Annette off at home and went to Lind. I'm just making sure it's still recording. It's weird not being able to see Audacity while I'm reading. <laughs> Brandon remained on the phone with his father as he walked, updating him on his progress. He said that he was walking along a gravel road and that he had taken a shortcut through a field. At one point, he mentioned that he could hear running water coming from somewhere nearby, though he couldn't see anything in the darkness. He just continued to walk towards what he assumed were the lights from Lind. Brian could do little more than listen as Brandon narrated his journey. Suddenly, shortly after 2.30 a.m., sorry, strangelings, I'm going to swear because it's what he said, he heard Brandon cry, oh shit, and the call immediately disconnected. Concerned, Brian frantically tried to call Brandon back, but he was unable to reach him. He called five or six times in quick succession, but all attempts went straight to Brandon's voicemail without ringing. So either he had turned his phone off, which why would he do that? Or something that had happened to the phone and made it inoperable. So that's the last time anyone heard from him. Brian wasn't sure what to do, so he drove back and forth over the same stretch of road numerous times with no success. There was no sign of Brandon or his car. Were you going to say something? No. Oh. No. <clears throat> Annette and Brian started calling some of Brandon's friends, and they came out to help look for him. They searched throughout the night, driving down various side roads and scouring the area for any sign of Brandon's car. After a couple of hours went by, they were certain they had thoroughly searched everywhere that Brandon might have gone. They drove back into Lind, checked the bar parking lot on the off chance that he actually had made it there, but it was dark and empty. By 6.30 a.m., Brian and Annette were out of ideas and beginning to panic, and so they called the police department to report him missing. Annette and Brian may have been frantic with worry, but it quickly became clear that the police did not share their concern. It's the old... He's an adult. He yeah. has the right to go missing yep. situation. I believe yep. I read that there was a law created, like the Brandon law or something. I wouldn't be surprised because... that This happens so often where parents are like, no, I know my kid. But it's hard because there are a lot of times where it is somebody just getting away from a weekend or whatever. And then you have the police wasting time looking for somebody that's just like gone for the weekend. Yeah. So it's like a weird fine line between. I feel like because they it need does to look ha- at the circumstances yeah. though. Oh like, yeah. Yeah. Like this was... circumstance is different. This isn't some kid. He just... was like parents come get me. This isn't some kid like, Oh, I'll just have my friend's house playing Xbox all weekend. Right. This is, this is like with the phone stuff. I mean, this was obviously something. He was actively trying to get his parents yeah. to find him. Yes. <laughs> so why would he go yeah. missing on purpose? Yeah. That makes no sense. And I can understand police not wanting to waste resources on something like that, but I feel like it has to be, the circumstances really have to be taken into consideration. Um, Let's see. Finally, a couple hours after they were initially 
After they had initially reported him missing, the police agreed to open a missing persons case. So that's actually pretty good. That's Sometimes they wait like days. Yeah, like two to three days yep. or something. After a perfunctory search around town, police felt confident that Brandon was not in Lind. A search of the roads leading into the town also failed to yield any evidence. As far as they could tell, he wasn't going to be found anywhere in the vicinity. Brian and Annette had continued their search for Brandon's car, certain that they would be able to locate it when the sun came up, but after several hours of searching, they came up empty-handed. Police were able to obtain Brandon's cell phone records, hoping that that would help pinpoint the location of his car. They made a startling discovery. Brandon hadn't been found in Lynn because he had never been anywhere near it. The calls he made to his parents the previous night had been made near Taunton, another small town located along State Highway 68. Taunton was on the main road to Canby, but it was northwest of Marshall. Hang and on a so second. I think he was heading. Was the root beer from Stephanie or was that from somebody else? Oh, I don't know. That might have been from. That might have been from. I don't think it was from Stephanie. No, that might have been from. Because why is Sprecher sold? That might have been nationwide? from Nikki and Randy. I think you're right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Nikki and Randy. If that was you. I think that was. So let me go back because where I want to say. So he. Taunton was northwest of Marshall. And I think he was trying to head southwest of Marshall. That's where he thought he was going. I can't remember now. I'm getting all confused. No wonder he was confused. But where his phone record or where his phone pinged or whatever was 25 miles away from Lind. He thought he was just a few miles from Lind. It sounds almost like he went in the opposite direction of what he thought he was going in. And it's very possible that he did. Um, okay, while Taunton was nowhere near Lind, it made sense that Brandon would have been close to it as he was traveling from home. Traveling to home from Canby. Less understandable is why he had still been in that area around 2 a.m. Okay, leaving Canby on Highway 68 is a 13-mile drive to Taunton, and it would normally take about 15 minutes. From Taunton, Brandon only had another 17 miles to go before he would be in Marshall. Okay, so it's on its way. Brandon left Canby shortly after midnight, like his friends believed. If he did, it somehow took him nearly two hours to go 13 miles, which makes no sense now i understand why people have like a a weird a time parallel. glitch yeah thing. yeah like he was abducted by aliens or something right i i mean you could argue that he was intoxicated and pulled over and like passed out or something and woke up there yeah. that's how he ended up in the ditch yeah. how do we know he didn't lose consciousness yeah, when he went in the totally ditch that's totally possible okay so i was wrong it's on the way to where he was going but he had only traveled 13 miles and it took two hours to do that <laughs> Armed with the information gleaned from the cell phone records, the search for Brandon was shifted to the area surrounding Taunton. It didn't take long for investigators to locate the car. It had been abandoned in a ditch off a gravel road just over the Lincoln County line and about a mile to the north of Highway 68. That's weird because he was supposed to be traveling on Highway 68. So it sounds like he took a turn somewhere off of a gravel road. Investigators searched the inside of the car thoroughly, and they found nothing that suggested Brandon had been injured. It was clear that he had accurately described what happened when he called his parents. The only thing he had wrong was his location. He told his parents that he could see lights in the distance that he thought were coming from Lind, but it was obviously now that he had been nowhere near Lind. Uh, the car's resting place was surrounded by grass and gravel, and there, was no, there were no discernible tracks to show which direction Brandon had walked when he left the car. Further analysis of his cell phone records showed that his call to his parents had been routed through a cell phone tower near Minota. Miniota? M-I-N-N-E-O-T-A. I think it's Minota. It's got to be Minota. Another small town on Highway 68 located about four miles southeast of Taunton. I need a map. I'm getting confused. <laughs> <laughs> An extensive ground search was launched with searchers concentrating on the area that had been pinpointed by Brandon's cell phone records. Helicopters flew over the area looking for anything that might be relevant. A team of bloodhounds were brought in, and they were quick to pick up on Brandon's scent. They followed a scent trail for nearly three miles as it skirted past fields and headed in a west-northwest direction to an abandoned farm. <coughs> Bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Ugh. The dogs continued past the farm and headed along the Yellow Medicine River. 
When they reached a certain point, their actions seemed to indicate that Brandon had entered the river at that spot. The water ranged from knee-high to around 15 feet deep. Even if Brandon had entered the water, it wouldn't necessarily mean he drowned. It was possible that he could have made it across to the other side, but dogs were unable to follow (laughs) the trail any further. Although I will see in the Reddit stuff later that other people claim that the dogs actually picked up his scent again outside the river or on the other side. That's what's but so it's frustrating like is that this just shows up in a lot of like reports like that, like just conflicting stuff yes, about like, like the exactly. dogs getting tracks and stuff. Worried that Brandon may have fallen into the water and drowned, the area along the two mile stretch of river was searched extensively. If Brandon had drowned, his body would have been washed downstream, but searchers found nothing. The sheriff walked up and down the riverbank for 30 days with no results. Investigators determined it was unlikely Brandon had drowned there, as his body should have been located if that were the case. The official search for Brandon was suspended after a week, but his family continued to search on their own. On May 24th and again on June 7th, around 100 volunteers joined Brandon's parents in searching areas to the south and east of Porter. Some of the searchers used ATVs to be able to cover more distance, while others walked or rode horses. Despite their extensive effort, they found no sign of Brandon. The search effort resumed in the fall once all the fields in the area had been harvested. Cadaver dogs were brought in to assist, and though they seemed to be following a scent trail into the area to the northwest of Porter, they eventually lost the scent and nothing was found. When winter came, bringing along snowstorms and frigid temperatures, the search was suspended once again. By this time, 122 square miles had been searched without turning up any trace of Brandon. A tip line that had been set up brought in 90 leads, but none of them led to Brandon. All told, the search had involved 500 volunteers, 34 dog handlers from nine different states, and countless hours of hard work to reveal like no evidence other than his car and the scent trail that the dogs initially picked up. Brandon's case was handed over to the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Investigation in 2010. From that point on, they would be the lead agency on the case. They focused their investigation on the area around Mud Creek, a tributary of the Yellow Medicine River, located directly north of Taunton and to the northeast of Porter. While they didn't find anything, they continued to search there periodically over the next few years. Many theories have been put forth to explain Brandon's sudden disappearance. Some people believe he may have staged his own disapp- disappearance, but like we said before, that doesn't really no, make any sense. that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There's I mean, better ways to go about that. Right. He was a good student. He had just completed a wind energy certificate course. He had no problems at home or school. He had been looking forward to transferring to a different school in Iowa to continue his studies. He had no legal troubles. He was close, to, close with his family. And just the circumstances around that night, like he's desperately trying to get his parents to find him yeah, it's not it, it, it doesn't add up to him no, voluntarily going missing. it's like trini gibson it's like why would you go through all that right rigmarole to disappear when you could just do it so easily yes another theory is that he was struck and killed by a car while walking and the driver panicked and hit his body i mean i just feel like they would have found evidence unless the body was taken well out of the search area but who would transport a body if they you know what i mean and Usually, I think you... if it would have happened after his O S exclamation on the phone, mm-hmm. you would have heard. I right, I agree with him that too. being hit by a car. Yeah, I think you would have heard that. Yeah, and there would have been evidence. There would yeah. have been blood, yeah. tire marks, yep. anything. Yep. I do oh. remember one of the po- one of the theories being that he fell down into like a well or like. A... I yep, I read that too okay. because like out in the country, yeah. There, yeah. People will have wells like that that aren't marked in any yeah. way. And he just fell down one of them. Yeah. Um, I mean, foul play is possible, but it's a really like kind of remote, sparsely po- populated area. What are the odds that there's some murderer like lurking out? I know, just, but you like, got to wonder what his town? last exclamation was about. I mean, what was that? Fall- I to me, that's like you're walking and you realize you're about to fall in a a creek or something you know what i mean or somebody's right there that, that could you didn't be know too. Was there before i don't know if i'd i i don't know that yeah i guess you would you could swear maybe i just think of what would my reaction be if i were walking and all of a sudden there was a person there i almost uh, feel my like my reaction would have been exactly what he said probably but then i i yeah unless he was like attacked in that very moment and didn't but I think have a you chance would have heard to say him anything. being attacked too right and why did his phone go out 
Why did his phone go off? Right. You know, I don't know. This one's always been weird. Doesn't add nothing no. really make there no. is a theory that I I do there is a theory that I think is actually really plausible it and it's in Reddit. <laughs> no, it's not Bigfoot. <laughs> um it doesn't seem like it would be a crime of opportunity. Like, who would be hanging out <laughs> yeah. in the middle of a farm field? Farm. Especially because his dad was on the phone with him when he was cutting through fields and stuff. It'd be different if he stayed on a road. Yeah. But he was in an area where yeah. nobody should just be hanging out waiting to kill somebody. It just doesn't make sense. Um, it says it was possible and quite probable that his disappearance was nothing more than a tragic accident. He was attempting to make his way on foot through darkened fields and side roads. There were no streetlights to guide him, no houses or businesses he could use as landmarks, except that, you know, old abandoned farm house he came to. He was surrounded by corn and soybean fields, and they would have all looked alike in the dark. He mentioned to his father that could, he could hear running water while he was walking, though he didn't seem concerned about it. It's possible that he did slip into the river at some point, but it wouldn't necessarily mean that he drowned, and I think they would have found his yeah. body. He could have gotten up out of the water disoriented, but still very much alive. He may have been able to keep walking for a while, but he would have been wet and cold and likely would have succumbed to hypothermia. Also, there are wild animals in Minnesota. Bear, large cats. I've, I've actually seen his name like brought up in some smiley face killer stuff. Oh, really? And that's, yeah. Nothing. No, but it, but it, it mm. gets dragged into there because there might have been water involved and it it's was in Midwest. Minnesota. Yeah. yeah. So it, that didn't even. <laughs> I'm not really buying it. Yeah, that didn't, that didn't cross my mind at all, actually. Uh, if Brandon had run into a wa- I still think there would have been evidence. Like an animal's not going to hide evidence no. there would there would be something left yes. there's always something left after an animal attack big puddle of blood or blood traces yeah so this is just like a synopsis of him uh, this you can find this on the fbi website too and there, i've seen pictures of like um age progression of what he would look like now yeah. that he'd be in his 30s Brandon Swanson has been missing since may 14th 2008 he was 19 years old five foot five Ooh, he's a shorty that's how tall I am. There you That's go. short for a dude, I think. Yeah. And weighed around 125 pounds. He had brown hair and blue eyes, was last seen in Canby, Minnesota, wearing a pair of blue jeans, a blue striped polo shirt, a black hooded sweatshirt that zipped up the front, and a white Minnesota Twins baseball cap. He was also wearing eyeglasses with silver frames, as well as a sterling silver chain. He was carrying a black Motorola. Wow. <laughs> Probably a flip phone, <laughs> a wallet, and car keys. Okay, so we're going to get into some of the theories. It's always weird uh, to think about, like, if I disappeared. It's always weird when you get somebody's last, like, appearance. Like, what, like, you know, Kurt disappeared. He was wearing drive. a flannel. Kurt was, he was wearing a flannel, a Dazed and Confused <laughs> t-shirt, and a Dawn Squatching cap. <laughs> oh, that's funny. He was carrying a McDonald's McCafe. <laughs> a McDonald's McCafe. <laughs> so this is posted by Huge Raspberry, and this was just two months ago. So people are still talking about this yeah. actively. But I could have sworn. That's what I was looking up on my phone. I could have sworn that there was an update that they thought they found his remains. Oh, I, but didn't I must find have that. I must have like that confused with somebody else with another disappearance. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't because come when I looked up anything. news, I didn't see anything about them finding his remains. Mm-mm. So maybe I was thinking of something else. Okay, so huge raspberry. <laughs> <laughs> we love the work of huge raspberry. Yes, we do. I'm not sure if there's an exact timeline for his call to his parents because someone, this is like a response to someone saying, hey, did anybody post a timeline? And when he said, uh, see, there's, it's interesting because people reference stuff that I don't see anywhere else. I'm like, where do they get this information? So he, he must have said something to the effect of, oh, not another fence. He was climbing over fences to get through these fields um, and then swore and the call was lost. But what I do know is that the dogs did a pretty accurate track of him following the road in a U shape, though backwards, if that makes sense. He went south until he hit a crossroad, then took a right that matched what he told his parents, then continued on that road until he hit another crossroad, then turned right again. So now going back up the U. At some point on that road, he found a driveway, thinking it was a farmhouse or field he could cut across to save time. That turned him left. When he got to where the house should have been, it was just a burned out foundation. Again, all this matches between dog tracks, the dog tracking him and the phone call to his dad. Instead of going back to the road, he turned right and cut across the farmstead. 
There is where he ran into multiple fences, and that again matches with the dog tracking and his conversation with his dad. Between the fences and other obstacles, he was pushed closer to the Yellow Medicine River. He told his dad that he could hear water running, i.e. the river, and then there was the oh shit and silence. The dog tracked him into and out of the river within a few feet. So this is different than what I said before. Yeah. The dog track continued on until it ended when it came to a gravel road that had just been graded that morning. The dogs could not pick up any scent after that. It is very possible that he went into a field or continued onward in a northwest direction after he fell into the river before passing out from exhaustion or cold, especially if he was intoxicated, and never seeing another person. According to a search and rescue professional, cadaver dogs hit on a small creek slash field about five to six miles from where he fell into the river. They also hit on a couple pieces of farm machinery that were near the road at the time of their search. But this was years later. But the farmer denied them permission to go into the field and search. That's weird. According to the searcher, there are only about four weeks a year when it is feasible to search, depending on the weather. They can't search after fields are planted or before they are harvested. They can't search during spring flooding or winter due to snow and ice and can't search during November or December due to deer hunting and the danger to the dogs. So that was the end of that post. And I think, yeah, there's more about the farm stuff. So this post is from Paul Rudder on Reddit, and it's under the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit. This was one year ago. I first heard about this case years ago, possibly on a podcast called Thinking Sideways. Sweet. I <laughs> love Thinking Sideways. But it was brought to my attention again this morning on the Unexplained Mysteries podcast. And then Can't he, wait for the day somebody says, I heard about it on a podcast on called The, the Strange, Strange Sessions. Sessions. <laughs> um, in a nutshell, a 19-year-old from Minnesota on the way home from a party crashed his car into a ditch and called his parents for help. They tried to come pick him up, but couldn't find him or his car at the location he gave them. The vehicle was found 25 miles away the next day. I've seen a lot of people talk about how familiar he was with the area and surmise that this is some kind of red flag, that he deliberately gave the wrong location or something, but I haven't seen many people discuss how easy it is to be disoriented when you're intoxicated, especially if you're a 19-year-old and not used to being tipsy or driving home on dark back roads at night. He was only 19. He probably didn't have a whole lot of years of drinking experience under his belt, if you think about it, right? Well, if he was from Wisconsin. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> anyway, he got out of the car to look for a nearby landmark and was on the line with his parents for an hour or so until he suddenly said, oh, shit. But and it sounds like he's not, it doesn't sound like he's so incoherently drunk that, you know. You think that the article would mention, any of these would reference his parents saying he like, sounded intoxicated. I've been drunk. I've been good and drunk, but I've never done stuff like this right i've never like i don't know gotten so lost or disoriented yeah yeah Yeah. um i read a really compelling theory at the following thread and he leaves a link if you scroll down to the replies i believe it's the very top response it essentially puts forth the notion that brandon was walking chipped into the river would explain the o which would explain the oh shit and as well as as the phone line staying active, which I don't understand that because they s- earlier it said it that the off. phone call was cut off and his dad repeatedly tried to call him back. Um, I wish I knew what the truth was because you would be able to figure out so much depending on what happened with the phone line. His phone was never recovered, which would kind of make sense if it was carried downstream for many miles or just sunk underwater somewhere. Um, many people assume he may have drowned, which seems to be the most common explanation people stick with, but his body was never found and police dogs did pick up a scent that continued beyond the river, which would support the theory that he made it to the other side alive. I feel that this isn't mentioned enough if it is true, but why would they pick up his scent beyond the river if he drowned? The theory continues that he was now dealing with being freezing cold from the water and the temperatures. It was probably about 40 degrees that night. So he basically, cause it was May. And May in Minnesota. Minnesota gets a lot colder than it does here. Um, So it still could have been pretty chilly at that time of night. So he basically just stumbled into a farmer's field and passed out in the crops. Then that morning while still asleep, he may have been run over by a piece of farming equipment. Yeah, but... 
supposedly one of the dogs got hit got a hit on a piece of farming equipment but the farmer wouldn't allow a search of his land which is really suspicious if you think about it i mean they're looking for a missing person but then He's, why the o the os word why that that well they said so they're saying that he was walking along and he fell into the river and that's where the os but you would have heard a splash on the phone i feel like if he fell unless in the river. his phone maybe he dropped it because that, that was the last they heard of him the phone was disconnected, yeah, but, yeah. hitting water. I mean, a Motorola flip phone back at that time probably <laughs> would have instantly That's been true. rendered That's unusable. True. Yep. They're and that he waterproof like they are now. Right. And that he after. So he fell in the water yeah. and after that he came out of the water and that's when he probably succumbed to hypothermia or passed out in a field. And then was I saw this mentioned many places that he was hit by farming equipment. And they pop the farm. It's not even that the farmer would even know. I mean, well, it sounds like he knew if he was refusing to let them search possibly, his field. Possibly. It says the other possibility I haven't seen mentioned, and I'm not sure how realistic th- this is, is that whoever ran him over with the farming equipment might not even realize it was a human body. Because I'm sure, I mean, deer, you see deer. Yeah, but you don't run over deer with a tractor. I have no idea. No, because I think I'm assuming you got to get out. They'd of have it. to get out and move it. Yeah. Like, Getting run over by farm equipment isn't high on my list of ways I want to go. No. That always makes me think of... The man in the moon? The happening, where oh. the one person like goes underneath the lawnmower to kill themselves. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. There's another movie like back in the day with either Jason or Jeremy London. I don't remember which one is in it and Reese Witherspoon. I think it's called The Man in the Moon. It's really old. Let's just say somebody... Farm equipment. Yes, it's not good. But this person says some of these farming machines are absolutely massive with enormous blades. They could slice through a human body with, like, no problem. But I'm pretty sure whoever's driving the tractor would have known. You would think so. Yeah, because it would be spitting... Blood everywhere? Everywhere. I don't yeah. know. I mean, I don't know. I don't honestly don't know how that works. If you're a farmer, let us know. Like, I'm assuming that you're going to see a... Deer. I would think so, too. Although, if you're, like, if you're doing corn, you might not see something laying in the cornfield. I also... I mean, I feel like I've been out really early in the morning before the sun is up, and people are out there. Oh, yeah, they are. So if it were dark out, I mean, they have headlights, but if it were dark out, maybe you wouldn't even see something like that. No, it's possible. So this last one, it's kind of a longer one. It's by, here we are, Bethany. Beth Ramone. And this one, apparently a lot of people liked her post because it was like, I think it got like a gold, whatever that yeah, means. Yeah, the metal. Look at Krista becoming a Reddit expert. <laughs> I just saw it noted somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Bethany, and this is actually my first post. I've been a lurker for several years, pretty adamant about staying that way, but I've discovered some little known details about this case, and I simply can't keep them to myself. I know there have been at least a few threads on Brandon as well as a sub, but the sub isn't very active, and there hasn't been a post on him for a couple of months. So when was this posted? Usually I can find, it didn't say when this is posted or I missed it. Right, it's not always good about saying that. Just to summarize for people who aren't familiar, okay, I don't, I won't go through that again. The general consensus seems to be that following the fateful O expletive, Brandon's phone immediately hung up and his parents tried to call him back several times. But upon watching the Nancy Grace, the Nancy Grace segment where his mother is interviewed, of which only three minutes seem to exist. Does anyone know where I can find the full version? I'd be interested in watching that too. Brandon's mother explicitly states otherwise. I read through the comments and nobody else seemed to catch it. Here's the exact quote. Interviewer, did you try to call him after the O expletive? Annette Swanson says, oh yes, we did. We didn't immediately hang up the phone. You know, we called his name. We tried to, you know, thinking that he still had the phone, that it was very near him, that he could pick it up or that he could hear our voice. And we called out to him several times. We realized he's, he's not there. That was the end of the quote. So actually, it, according to this interview, the phone line did stay open for yeah. a little bit, and they, and they would have heard something. So A splash if he went if, through the water. Yes, if the phone line was still open, they would have heard a car hitting him. If he had been attacked, they would have heard that. I mean, they would have heard whatever was happening. So to me, the most logical thing is he dropped the phone and was no longer with it, or the phone... Yeah. Well, if the line stayed open, he must have just dropped the phone. I wish there was a recording of that I know. phone call. Of course, this info can't prove any theories, but I think it certainly has the potential to rule some out. If the call was still active, but there was simply silence after the OS, 
then his parents surely would have heard something if he had fallen in the river or had been attacked by an animal. Apparently, his father had only heard, quote, what sounded like his foot slipping. But could you really identify sounds that specific with a 2008 Motorola Silver? Probably not. But that almost that almost does sound like falling into a well right. or falling into some kind of pit. A well, right? Yeah. This info seems to be support my theory of foul play. I think he saw someone that he knew and was afraid of, dropped the phone, and ran. On YouTube and Reddit, I've seen a few comments left by people from the area who claim that they've heard rumors about Brandon owing a drug debt and being found and killed by dealers. One person said that he was left in a field and ground up with cattle feed. The other said they heard that he was buried in one of the Dakotas. Obviously, this one is much more likely. Unless, but they would have had to have followed him, him from in their the party. Car. Yeah, yeah, which which is possible. Yeah. Um, of course, you'd have to take the comments like that with a grain of salt, but it makes quite a bit of sense. Here are some reasons why. Brandon is featured on the FBI's VICAP yep. database, and then she has a link to that, along with, as of last year, only around fifty people or so. This is interesting because apparently the majority, if not all cases featured on there, are speculated to be victims of crime. They talk about it quite a bit on the last two pages of the lengthy web sleuth thread. And then she posts a link. Perhaps the FBI knows more than they are or are legally allowed to let on to. A pipe was found in Brandon's car. My first thought was like a a pipe. Yeah. Not like, <laughs> like, a, not like a, a piece of plumbing. Yeah. <laughs> This was confirmed on the Nancy Grace segment. It is not specified what type. Of course, a lot of teenagers smoke pot, and this doesn't really prove anything, but at least somewhat helps support the drug dealer theory. So that that is interesting. There's an interesting connection there. Allegedly, at least one of the party goers claimed, although not to the authorities but to a local resident, that Brandon was, quote, very intoxicated upon leaving the party. This could explain his disorientation. The authorities claim that they didn't think he was intoxicated, I have a feeling that the party goers were being tight-lipped for a reason. Perhaps he had been accused of snitching on someone and his friends had known about it but were scared of being, quote, next. Brandon was taking back roads instead of the main highway. Perhaps he was trying to avoid someone specific besides the cops. It's been almost 10 years and not a single trace of Brandon or his phone has been discovered. The area has been searched extensively. Thousands of professional man hours have been put into it, but still nothing. Another interesting yet unexplained tidbit was that apparently Brandon's car doors were open upon discovery. This was confirmed on Charlie Project, and in my opinion, points strongly to foul play. I really want to apologize for this being extremely long and redundant, but I find this case incredibly interesting, and I think some of those facts can contribute to an interesting discussion. And then she thanks people for reading her post. That was the only post I saw that referenced... The Nancy Grace... That and also that a pipe was found in his car. Like, that's kind of... It, it could be completely unrelated to anything, but... Yeah, you're going to search any 10 teenager, like, back in the day, search any of their cars, you're going to find right. a and pipe and eight of them. And, I mean, when something like this happens in your town, and it's a small town, I think people just start throwing out crazy theories that turn into rumors like a drug deal gone bad or something or he owed people but money. But even that, is a drug dealer like selling you pot going to kill you? Yeah, in rural Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, it just, I don't know. It just doesn't feel know. right to me either. No, it doesn't, it doesn't fit. To me, I mean, there's a difference between Breaking Bad and, and somebody <laughs> selling you a little weed. Yeah, Breaking Bad is a fiction, fictional TV show. Yeah, you know, but I just don't. And I feel like if the phone line did stay open, there would have been sounds of a struggle or you would have heard the other person's voice. Or, you or a splash. That's or a splash. strange. Yeah. Although, I mean, they heard the sound of his foot slipping. That could have been the sound of him sliding down into, into the, the river. Yeah, that could have And they easily, just didn't hear yeah, a splash. That could, have, that could totally be. I kind of buy the idea of him falling into the water, losing his phone, getting back out of the water, and now he's cold and wet and intoxicated and he passes out somewhere and gets hit by farm equipment. I, I, I can totally I could, buy I could, it. I could actually kind of buy that too, but cause he would just like get the, ground the, the up farmer with the had to know that he hit something and then he could have been like, Ooh, right. And you know, not that's said not anything. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Like, would you, 
I, well, I would, of course. Well, yeah, say but I mean, I mean, you know what <laughs> I mean? I'm a good it's like, person. It's like, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. And that could explain why he was hesitant about them searching the field. So right. I don't know. I can, I can kind of buy that theory, too. I feel like he's not in the river. They searched it yeah, extensively. No. It was only two mile stretch. But you think his phone would have been on the bank of the river? Something. Yeah. You'd think they would have been able to find his yep. phone. It is odd that absolutely no trace of him has been found except the car. Yeah. The door is being open, though. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's really significant or not. Like when police found the car, all the doors were open. Yeah. I don't know why Brandon would have opened all the car doors. I don't know. I don't know either. I, I don't think I, we'll. I don't think we'll get an answer I'm on this one. I'm kind of liking the farm equipment theory. I really am. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the only thing that kind of explains everything. Yeah, I like this one because it had that one of those weird phone call. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I remember people asked it. us about this when we did the phone call episode. Why oh, we didn't talk really? about that? Yeah, and I said I think we talk about it at a future date. This is the future date. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few years later, it only yeah. took a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, so that's it. If anybody else, hey, I know we have some Minnesota listeners, so if you have more information about this that was well, i'm sure you do because you know how my research is i just but, don't uh, I, the, like the biggest weird thing to me is the farmer and refusing to let them search it is field. weird like, why it's would weird. you care if they searched your field exactly that's that's what l- tips this into the run over by farm equipment right foul play in some way for me yeah mm-hmm. especially since the dogs picked up his scent on farm uh, equipment yep, yeah so <laughs> i'm 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 with you now on that theory mm-hmm. i am so it's funny. I, I, I know I read other Reddit posts where they talked about the possibility of him falling in a well. I just didn't include that here. But you're not the first time I heard that for sure. Yeah. I just don't know what it's like to run over a deer with farm equipment. Yeah, me either. Nor do I, I ever want to know what it's like to run over a deer But if you think about it, equipment. they're cutting. I don't know that you would notice. I think you would, but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, if you're a farmer, tell us. Would you notice if you ran over a dead body? Yeah, let us know. (laughs) I feel like there'd be a, eh, maybe not, not a smell. Like a deer carcass, I think there'd be a smell. It's probably been there for a while. Yeah. I don't know. Dang. Hmm. Yeah, there you go. Brandon Swanson. Yeah, that's not as uplifting as I hoped. Because mine is is rough, actually. Mine is kind of like, ugh. Like, I I feel bad about everything with this one. Uh, and this one is this one is interesting because it's like two different things, two different kinds of stories in one. So, okay. uh, my story is about Tina Resch, Christina Resch, or her married name is Christina Boyer. Okay. Um, Krista was very puzzled by the picture. Yeah, I didn't. It did not trigger any memories or knowledge for me. So most of this comes from a few different sources, including an October twenty seventh, two thousand fifteen article on Vice called "Quote: The Unbelievably Sad, Strange Story of a Girl and Her Poltergeist," and an article on the Sci Encyclopedia website called "Tina Resch, Columbus Poltergeist and Wikipedia." You ready? I'm ready. Uh-uh. Maybe I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Tina Resch was born on October 23rd, 1969, like a year older than me, which is, I always like look at how they are like mm-hmm. in relation to me. She was just like, I was born in 70. She was born in 1969. Tina Resch was born on October 23rd, 1969. At the age of 10 months, she was abandoned in a hospital emergency room. All attempts to trace her mother having failed, she was adopted two years later by John and Joan Resch, Columbus residents who had raised over 250 foster children wow. plus five of their own. Dang. Right? Props to them, unless yeah. they turn out to be bad foster yeah, parents. Yeah, Dang. we're going to get to that. Okay. Uh, not, not a horrible bad. Well, we'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. The Reshes were strict disciplinarians using corporal punishment to control the children in their care. Tina was said by Joan to be particularly unruly, considered different from other children from an early age. She was a happy child with a bubbly personality. However, sometimes she, quote, boiled over. At age eight, she was diagnosed as hyperactive and placed on medication. Teachers told John and Joan that she threw erasers and pencils causing a scene, but interestingly, they never actually saw her do so, but they were certain that she was the one behind it. Her schoolmates often made fun of her and called her crazy. I saw I already feel bad for the girl. Right, you know? yeah. The cruelty at school only worsened. John and Joan finally took Tina out of there when her schoolmates actually tied her up and taunted her on the playground. She did her schoolwork at home and had a private tutor. Initially, things went well. She thrived at home and enjoyed helping taking care of her foster siblings. 
However, subconsciously, she was under a great deal of stress. She spent almost her entire time at home and rarely ever left there. At home, Tina often felt ignored, and when a young woman who she regarded as her best friend and confidant was killed in a car accident, she felt entirely abandoned. Oh she became desperate to find her birth mother fantasizing a loving reunion. However, her adoptive parents refused to reveal her birth certificate. Strange disturbances began on March 1st, 1984, following an argument between Tina and Joan. Joan had asked her husband to deliver her punishment, but for once, Tina refused to submit, eventually trying to defend herself with a kitchen knife. In bed that night later, Tina noticed the numbers on her digital clock radio were racing. The radio started blaring music, and when she tried to stop it, it kept turning itself back on until she unplugged it. So here we get to the typical yeah. uh, adolescent, adolescent yeah. young girl with, uh, you know, young girl under emotional stress right. and poltergeist activity starting to happen. The next day, Joan was preparing dinner when a heart monitor attached to an infant sounded for no reason and persisted, as did its replacement after a visit by a serviceman. The next night, Joan briefly saw a dark shadow move in the living room. The next morning, the television set and the living room lights inexplicably turned off and on. Is Joan the, the mom? mom. Yep. Okay. The clothes dryer door slammed shut and the machine started turning on repeatedly. So totally poltergeist stuff yeah, happening here. Totally. Classic. Yep. Joan believed that Tina was just playing games and insisted that she stay where she could see her. Now both of them heard the dryer turn on, followed by the kitchen garbage disposal unit turning on. Next, every faucet in the house turned on all at once. So that's getting a total poltergeist. Yeah. And now she's seeing Tina there, knowing that she's not the one that's going around and turning all this stuff on. So Joan gathered the family in the family room where the wall's clock minute hand started spinning rapidly around the clock. John decided to call an electrician named Bruce Claggett. Bruce heard a loud howling sound on the telephone during the call, and he could barely hear what John was saying. When he arrived, he went to the breaker box, took the cover off, and inspected the breakers and made sure that there weren't any hot spots or loose joints. He couldn't find any explanation for what was happening in the house. Electrical items were running even when unplugged, and the electrician witnessed light switches apparently turning on by themselves and tape that was fastened over them disappearing. So that's weird. Yeah, that is weird. The Resh's son, Craig, returned home, and he also witnessed spontaneous movements of furniture and artwork, and he also saw a dark shadow move through the living room. Then after more disturbances, the Resh's finally called the police. One officer drew his gun upon seeing a metal pan fly out of a room. Other phenomena witnessed by the family included the movement of two eggs, which apparently moved through the door of the refrigerator, and sticks of butter creeping over a surface. And there's what? something really creepy about that. that. Is. Like sticks of butter like moving along I'm a surface. I'm picturing the movie Poltergeist. Yeah. The steak is yes. like inching across yes. the counter. And I see, that's what I see the, the butter as uh -huh. like scooting across the counter. Creepy. <laughs> John finally accepted that Tina wasn't to blame when furniture was violently disturbed while Tina was at church, although he continued to believe that she was somehow responsible for it. As word spread of the disturbances, visitors and other family members began to arrive, including a pastor who attempted a ritual blessing. The exorcism failed, and a couch slid across the living room floor and hit the priest in the leg. Flying objects began to strike Tina, a table pinning her to the floor, and a kitchen knife bling being flung at her. Mm. Tina noticed headaches and stomach aches whose timing seemed to relate to the phenomena. Joan now had the three youngest foster children living with them at the time placed in other homes temporarily. On March 5th, four days after the onset of the disturbances, John Resch asked a family friend, reporter Mike Harden, if he knew of an expert who could help. Having observed the phenomenon himself, Harden asked photographer Fred Shannon to try to capture them on film. This proved difficult, as although Shannon witnessed the phenomena, he would have nothing happen when he aimed a camera at it. Mm, it's like it would immediately stop mm -hmm. as soon as he tried taking a picture of it. Eventually, by aiming the camera where he wanted it and pretending his attention was somewhere else, he captured two shots of a phone apparently flying through the air, and that's, that's the picture posted. in the teaser. Okay. Uh, there's a couple, like two or three pictures online that show Tina like in the chair, like almost like a recoiling as the phone is like zooming in front of her. Mm -hmm. And these are interesting pictures. Like how do you fake it? Yeah. That's thing? the thing is that like the, the one, the, the Enfield photographs with the girls on the bed, yeah, it's the that girls jumping, jumping off a of bed. Mm -hmm. This one, I mean, she could be throwing it with her left hand, but in one of the pictures you see someone sitting on the couch 
like with a surprised look on their face across from her that would have totally seen her throw it with her hand. Mm -hmm. So this one is this one. They were all in on it. This one is a little harder to Mm -hmm. to debunk. Debunk for like I don't know this. These pictures don't set off my BS detectors. And I'll post a. I I think there's two pictures released or three. I'll post them in the group when I release this episode. But from the website jamesconrad.com, it says, "quote." According to James Randi's 1985 published report on the case, and Randy James Randi is a famous debunker. Like he debunks everything. I believe <laughs> his real killjoy. <laughs> he's a real killjoy. <laughs> but I believe that Brian Young oh. knew him, or or was like like part of his like skeptical society. Oh, okay. Uh, so he has like a history with James Randi, who has passed away since then. But according to James Randi's 1985 published report on the case. There are seven photographs out of 36 taken by Fred Shannon of the one or two phones in flight just after they had taken flight and landed on the floor. Frames 24, 25, 30, 31, and 32 show the phone in flight or hanging out of view on the other side of the chair, and in frames 12 and 29, the phone is already on the floor. In some of the frames, both phones are shown off the table. Although it is not clear as to whether a force of spontaneous telekinesis affected the second phone or if it was simply knocked off as the other one took flight. There are more instances that were not captured on camera. From Fate Magazine in September 1984, in an article called, quote, In his own words, Columbus Dispatch newspaper photographer Fred Shannon it says, quote, Mike and I sat down on the couch and Tina positioned herself on the love seat. On the floor in front of her was a colorful afghan, which the Reshes had told us once rose up off the floor and landed on Tina, covering her up. Within a very short time of Tina sitting down, we saw precisely that same event take place. I took a picture of Tina with the afghan over her. I sat for 20 minutes with the camera up to my eye and nothing was happening. But when I took the camera down from my face so that I wasn't immediately ready to take a picture, just like that, bingo, the phone went flying through the air. So I proceeded with my strategy. I brought the camera to my eye. I had everything all set. With my finger on the trigger, I stared at Tina for about five minutes. Then, without ever taking my eyes off of her, I brought the camera slowly down to my waistline. It was still pointed in her direction and my finger was on the shutter, but I let my head turn slowly towards the kitchen where the Reshes were talking with some visitors. I was waiting for something to move, all the while pretending that my attention was elsewhere. A few seconds later, I saw a white blur out of the corner of my eye. The resulting photograph captured not only the flying phone, but the frightened expression on Tina's face as she reeled back to keep from being hit by the phone. One thing I want to emphasize, I am damn sure that she did not throw those phones. I'm looking at the picture right now. I just don't. I I just don't. I don't know. The picture where she's, you can see her hand is here. Yeah, like almost like she had... But the way that the phone is going, I think it's that like if she had thrown across. it, I think the way if she, if she had thrown it, her hand would be somewhere blurry, else. like in motion. Oh, too. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but it he says, uh, he says, where was it here? Bah, bah, bah. One thing I want to emphasize, I am damn sure that she did not throw those phones. From what Mike and I observed, I would say that she could not possibly have thrown them. There's absolutely no way. We were sitting in a well-lit room. We were looking right at her. When one of us was looking away for a moment, the other had his eyes on her the whole time. Of course, as I've already noted, there were some things that took flight when she was nowhere near them. The candlesticks, for example. A little while later, Mike, Tina, and I were standing in the middle of the room when a Kleenex box sitting on the same table as the phones took flight. The box was no more than 18 or 20 inches from my right leg. It just went zip like a bullet past me and landed on the lamp table to the immediate right of the sofa. When it hit that table, though, it didn't move or skid despite the speed it had traveled to get there. It stopped just like it had landed in glue. Hmm. That's odd. Yeah, so there's some weird stuff going on here. Yeah, how could you control that? Yeah, yeah. so Hardin's story and Shannon's two pictures were published in the Columbus Dispatch on March 6th. They were republished by papers around the country and internationally. So now you can imagine what's going to happen when Mm -hmm. it's going internationally. Miss Lee Arnold, okay, and I think she's the one that's in one of the pictures. Miss Lee Arnold, Franklin County Children's Services uh, employee, says, quote, Tina was facing me and I saw her hands. It really shook me up because I could not explain what was going on. In one of the pictures, you can see there's a lady sitting on the couch over here, and I think that's uh, Miss Lee Arnold. I think that's her, and she looks surprised that the phone is kind of coming at her. Mm -hmm. 
So after this happened, the family stayed in the motel for three days, but the disturbances started up again the moment they returned to their home, which by now had been inundated by reporters and television crews. Of course. Yep. So on March 8th, a press conference was held for 40 media representatives. However, there was nothing happening for them to observe. After eight hours of this, Jones said to Tina, quote, something has got to happen. Drew Hodwell of WTVN-TV in Columbus had left his camera rolling, and when he watched the footage later, it showed Tina, having realized that no one was watching her, deliberately pulling over a table lamp, then screaming as if in fright. Mm. Just like we talked about. That just tosses doubt on everything, right? For the media, this changed the story to a case of fraud, and Tina became vilified for faking everything. Mm -hmm. So that reminds me of... That reminds me of what we talked about in the Poltergeist episode, where, where they were caught... Faking, faking which evidence. makes you question everything. Yep. Then. So now everybody totally turned against Tina. I could also understand where she's like, this yeah, is she's, really she's happening gonna, she's and gonna, nobody yeah, believes she's gonna, me. She's going to say something coming up. She's okay. going to say explain that coming up. But I remember seeing this. I, I swear to God, I remember seeing this when it happened. I remember seeing news footage hmm. where you could see her sitting there. And you could see her look and see that nobody's there. And she takes the, the cord wow. of the, the lamp and tugs it and then screams. Hmm. Hardin sought expert help from Duke University's parapsychology laboratory, which put him in touch with William Roll, who we talked about in the Poltergeist episode, Hmm. who was the then director of the Psychical Research Foundation. Roll was an experienced investigator of poltergeist-type phenomena for which he had coined the term recurring spontaneous psychokinesis, or RSPK, indicating that the person at the center of the disturbance was the unconscious cause of it as opposed to a ghost or spirit. He suggested that Tina be examined by a neurologist and also agreed to visit the house with an assistant trained in clinical psychology named Kelly Powers. The pair arrived on March 11th and Roll began taking statements from numerous witnesses. Phenomena initially observed by Roll had a possible normal explanation, generally being an action on Tina's part, although Tina herself apparently believed that the objects were moving unaided. For her part, Powers witnessed occurrences for which Tina could not have been responsible. Roll claimed that for the first three days he was there, nothing happened. Then on the fourth day, he and Tina were in her room talking when a mug was thrown across the room. He noted that she was too far away to have any contact with the mug. He now believed that something real was happening in the house. During another incident, Dr. Roll heard a crashing sound behind him in the master bedroom. They went in there and found a painting laying on the floor that had come off the wall. As they tried to put it back up, his tape recorder was then thrown across the room. Then a pair of pliers that he was using was also thrown across the room. Dr. Roll was convinced that the house needed to be investigated further. He also believed that Tina needed some help and counseling. She went with him to North Carolina for testing. As far as the footage of her pulling the lamp over, Tina said that she was, quote, just fooling around, and she said, quote, I was tired and angry. I did it so that the reporters could have what they came for, and then they could just leave, mm. which I totally get. It totally get. makes sense. I totally get. You know, it's like you're, you have these 40 people or whatever in your house waiting for something to happen, and you want them gone. Mm-hmm. You're going to fake something. Right. So I don't think that that was a malicious thing on her part. Or I really evidence don't. that she had been faking everything Everything, else. yeah. yeah. Especially since people witnessed stuff when she wasn't even there. Yeah, but, you know, and like we said, that showed up in her Poltergeist episode where it's mm-hmm. like, God, don't fake something because then right. everybody's going to assume Calls everything every, into question. Every single thing was fake. On March 13th, Roll and Powers briefly left the house and on their return learned that the phenomena had returned with a vengeance. Roll arranged to take Tina for testing at centers in North Carolina, and while making the arrangements, he witnessed the same screeching sound on the telephone that the electrician had heard. Almost like whatever mm. is causing this is like affecting the phone lines. Mm-hmm. On March 14th, Roll witnessed motion by an object, a teacup, while neither Tina or anyone else was close enough to move it. In 52 minutes, he recorded 15 movements of objects and five unexplained sounds. Six objects had moved while he had been watching Tina, and he was positive she was not responsible. He had handled three of these objects beforehand, checking for any kind of trick devices on them. Roll had Tina tested for psychokinetic ability, observing that she rolled doubles on dice at a rate well above chance, which is interesting. Yeah. However, in a formal test carried out by Richard Broughton at the Institute for Parapsychology on March 29th, she scored no better than chance. She then broke her leg in an accident and had to be taken home. 
In a second set of tests in October, Tina was hypnotized and objects were observed to take flight. One traveled about 40 feet and some objects rounded corners. Well, that's weird. That's interesting. Three factors were found to suppress the incidents. When Tina was asleep, deliberate attempts to stimulate psychokinesis and rolling video cameras. And it's weird. It's almost like when there's a camera rolling on it, nothing will happen. happen. It, It knows when the cameras are watching it. Psychological testing revealed signs of a neglected and abusive past and emotional reactions typical of a much younger child, but no actual psychosis. Further psychokinetic testing in July of 1985 was negative. Neurological tests, though, revealed a brainstem anomaly and resulted in a diagnosis of Tourette's syndrome, which Roll hypothesized manifested itself as RSPK. That's interesting. Hmm. Like she had never exhibited signs of Tourette's, it was but coming it's out believed through... that it was coming out through the poltergeist activity. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. That is actually. interesting. Following research by Michael Persinger, Roll also linked the disturbances to a magnetic storm that had swept through the Earth's atmosphere during March 1st through 3rd, 1984. And this is weird. This name pops up again. Based on research by Hal Pudoff, and I believe we talked about Hal Pudoff in our episode about remote viewing. Okay. So that's interesting. Based on research by Hal Pudoff and William Jones, he further speculated that RSPK is powered by something called zero-point energy, which in this case was harnessed by Tina's subconscious mind. National media coverage brought the case to the attention of the newly formed Committee for Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, or PSYCHOP, which was run by James Randi. Stage magician James Randi, a prominent skeptic, was tasked with investigating the case, and he arrived at the Resch residence on March 13, 1984, accompanied by two other investigators, reporters, and television crews. He offered the family $10,000 if they could show him spontaneous phenomena he considered genuine. Joan welcomed two other investigators there, but refused to let James Randy enter her home. That's weird. Do you think? It is, but, you know, you you know that this guy is going to poo-poo anything that's happening. One of the articles that I read, like, had, like, really interesting good versus bad stuff with real William Roll as the good and James Randi as mm. the bad, like, mm-hmm. like do it kind of like almost doing battle in the house. So she refused to let him enter in August. James Randi was invited to a parapsychology association conference where he gave a presentation focused on critiques of Fred Shannon's photos of the phone. A subsequent article in the skeptical inquirer attributed the phenomena entirely to trickery on the part of an attention-seeking teen, claiming that the images showed that Tina herself might have thrown the telephone. He drew attention to the video footage that showed her pulling over the lamp and cited testimony from reporters who had saw, who saw nothing when they were there and left completely unimpressed. He also criticized Roll's observational methodology. Randy finally concluded that the poltergeist activity was faked by a teenage girl who just craved attention. In his book called Unleashed, Roll complains that Randy ignored testimony from family members, friends, associates, and investigators who had witnessed incidents and that he misrepresented. And that he mis- Misre- misrepresented? Thank you. And that he misrepresented Roll's written reports, for instance, saying that Tina was alone during one spell of phenomena when Roll had actually written that he had been there with her during that time. Hmm. So Ro- is that saying that he's like actually lying? Who? Yeah, Roll is saying that Randy is actually, you know, like cherry picking stuff. Like he didn't talk to people who actually witnessed right. stuff. He talked to reporters who left unimpressed nothing. because they yeah. witnessed nothing. So mm-hmm. like they're saying that he's not lying, but that he's cherry it's picking. Very biased. He's then. he's he's cherry picking stuff that's going to show that it was faked. Mm-hmm. And Roll said no. Like he was there with Tina when some of this stuff happened. Roll also objected to Randy saying that he or Roll had claimed to see a tape recorder behind him move when he had made no such claim. In a drawn map representing part of the home, Randy omitted relevant items of furniture and altered facts to suit his theories. A couch which moved by itself, and which Randy claimed being on wheels could easily have been pulled out by Tina using her foot, was in fact on fixed wooden legs. So, you know, you have him, like, I don't want to say faking stuff, but just like like manipulating mm-hmm. stuff to say right. how it was faked. So Roll is taking the, no, I mean, that that couch is on wooden legs. You can't just pull it with your foot. 
Roll notes that Randy failed to obtain corroboration from three witnesses who had been present during the telephone episode caught in Shannon's photos, which would be Shannon, Mike Harden, and Tina's older brother, Craig. He further points out that Tina was right-handed, casting doubt on Randy's assertion that she threw the phones with her left hand. Although you could still throw your phone with your left hand. I mean, yeah, you know. Just the position in that picture, I think you're right. The way her arms look, it doesn't look like she could have thrown it. According to skeptical psychology professor Terrence Hines, quote, The Resch poltergeist turned out to be so elusive that no one ever actually saw a single object even start to move on its own. This included the newspaper photographer who found that if he watched an object, it would stubbornly refuse to budge. So he would hold up his camera and look away. One of the photos obtained in this way was distributed by the Associated Press and touted widely as proof of the reality of this phenomenon. Examined closely, the photographic evidence in this case strongly suggests that Tina was faking the occurrences by simply throwing the phone and other flying objects when no one was looking. Randy's careful and exact analysis of other photos, many unpublished, of Tina and her, fine f- and her flying phone strengthened the conclusion that she was merely faking everything. The editor of the Columbus Dispatch, Luke Feck, embarrassed by the revelation that he and his paper were taken in by so obvious a ruse, refused Randy permission to print the photos he had given him earlier in an apparent attempt to suppress the evidence of Tina's trickery and the newspaper's credibility. By this time, Tina had been completely written off as a fraud, and the only one that seemed to really believe in her was Roll and the people who had been at the house and had witnessed these events themselves. Tina attempted suicide at age 15 and soon afterward escaped the Resch house, where it later came out that while all of this had been going on, she was being sexually abused by an older brother at the house. At 16, she became married to an abusive and controlling man, escaping the relationship a year later. She became pregnant during a second relationship, which was also abusive, and she gave birth to a daughter named Amber on September 29, 1988. In 1992, she began dating 28-year-old David Heron, a truck driver who, like Tina, was a divorced parent with a toddler. By all accounts, the couple were happy. And it's just like, it adds to the possibility of the psycho kinetic stuff where she was being sexually abused at the house Mm -hmm. while all this was going on on top of the punishment she was receiving right and and when people grow up that way and are are taught they're not worth anything that's that's how they end up with relationships and she went from one abusive relationship to another abusive relationship to finally meeting this guy that seems like a good guy okay so The following comes from the janbanning.com website, which is the website of Dutch artist and photographer Jan Banning. It says, quote, Around noon on April 14th, 1992, Tina left David's trailer where she was staying with David and Amber, her daughter. She took his car. When she returned six hours later, David was waiting for her, a look of wild despair on his face, crying and saying, quote, I can't get Amber up. What she found inside was every mother's worst nightmare. She said that she, quote, went into the room and Amber was laying there and she wasn't moving and she wasn't breathing. Together, they raced her daughter to the hospital in the nearby town of Carrollton, but an hour later, Amber was declared dead. The autopsy report ruled that her death was caused by, quote, blunt force trauma of the head and abdomen, in particular lacerations of the pancreas. For two and a half long years, Tina was kept on remand, grieving her child and fearing what might be next. The media had labeled her a kind of witch and a degenerate mother. Her chances to get a fair trial with an unbiased jury seemed minimal. During these two and a half years, her court-appointed pro bono lawyer named Jimmy Barry came to see her only three times. Two and a half Mm. years, he only came to see her three times. So, I mean, is she claiming this was like, what is she claiming happened to the baby? She, no, she doesn't know. I mean, we're going to get into it okay, a little bit, okay. but but she's being held for the death of her baby. Sure. The unmotivated impression that he gave off only fueled her fear of being convicted. During his third visit, after approximately 30 months in jail, her lawyer, Barry, dazzled Christina with a comment that she's most likely going to get the death sentence. Oh, my God. He offered her one chance to avoid this, which is something called an Alford plea. And this is weird. I wonder if Brad Medeiros ever covered this case on his podcast because Hmm. I think he would do it because this is like lawyery stuff that I don't really get. Right. The Alford plea is a rarely used and rather bizarre deed of compromise in which a suspect holds on to their plea of not guilty 
while simultaneously accepting a proposed sentence in order to escape a more severe one, such as the death sentence. Isn't that sort of like, what is no contest? I don't know. You're not claiming that you're guilty, but you're not going to just... Yeah, but in practice, this is still regarded as a suspect being declared guilty. Mm -hmm. And I said, I wrote in here, it's weird. Brad might do a better job on this Mm -hmm, one. mm -hmm. And here's a definition of it from the internet. An Alford plea is defined as a guilty plea in which a defendant maintains their innocence but admits that the prosecution's evidence would likely result in a, result in a guilty verdict if brought to trial. It's also known as a, quote, best interests plea, where the defendant registers a formal admission of guilt towards charges in criminal court while, simultaneous, while simultaneously expressing their innocence towards those same charges. So mm-hmm. you're basically saying you're guilty, but you're also not guilty. Yeah. Which is weird. Like, I'm not guilty, but I'm going to just admit it yeah. to make you yeah. happy and yep. to get a deal out of it, right? If Tina did not agree to the Alford plea, Barry told her that he would pull back and leave her case. Frantic due to the threat of execution and being influenced by a hefty dose of antipsychotic, she agreed to it, basically declaring herself guilty. What state is this in? I, I think... I don't know. I'm not sure. I can't remember. So the judge sentenced her to life in prison plus 20 years for, quote, murder by failing to seek proper medical attention and, quote, aggravated aggravated battery for seriously disfiguring Amber's pancreas. Then Jan in that article writes, quote, I had the chance to briefly meet Christina Boyer in 2013 when after one and a half year of pulling strings, the Georgia Department of Corrections finally granted me access to a few prisons in Georgia, amongst which one was the Pulaski Women's Prison. In an improvised studio, I shot photos of dozens of female prisoners. In the months that followed, I used the few questions I had been allowed to ask them in order to search the internet for their stories. Tina was one of the last, and the more I read, the more I became convinced that she was innocent. During the court case against her boyfriend David, a couple months after she accepted the Alford plea, there was evidence that seemed to exonerate Tina. The doctor that handled Amber's autopsy, Stephen Dutton, was heard under oath where he stated that the consequences of the blows to Amber's head would have manifested almost immediately. Because David claimed that Amber had first played and eaten happily for a couple of hours, only succumbing shortly before Tina's return, it seems likely that if the deadly blows were the cause of death, they must have been sustained during Tina's absence because she was gone for six hours. She completely, she left. She took Mm. his car and left, and when she came back is when Amber was dead. No one in the courtroom seemed to contest that Tina had raised her daughter to the hospital immediately after coming home and finding her in that condition. On top of this, Dunton stated that, although it contradicts his original report, the damage to Amber's pancreas had not been lethal and would probably have healed all by itself. After further research involving Dutch specialists... uh, After further research involving specialists, it only strengthens... So they weren't Dutch specialists? They were. (laughs) But I'm not even going to try these names. After further research involving Dutch specialists such as pathologist Frank van der Groot and neurosurgeon Goose Boot only strengthened my first impressions. Tina couldn't have been responsible for the lethal injuries, and she had brought her daughter to the hospital immediately as any good person would do. By now, 26 years have passed. David was sentenced to 20 years for cruelty to children. He was released in 2011 while Christina is still imprisoned. Oh my gosh. To this day, she has constantly denied the crime she was sentenced for, but as long as she doesn't show remorse, her chances of parole are very slight. So wait a minute. So they charged and convicted her, right, for neglecting to seek medical attention yeah. although nobody's contesting that she immediately took her daughter yeah. to that yeah. makes no sense no, this is so messed up yeah uh and what 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 killed her was this this alford plea where she basically said i'm guilty mm-hmm. because she, she was afraid sentence. of the death sentence and we'll get to some more shenanigans involving all this, but I just feel bad for her. Yeah. You know, I really do. Uh, I mean, is the feeling that the the guy did it? I, I think so. Mm. Uh, she regularly suffers from depression and is burdened with guilt. Around last Christmas, she tried to cut her own throat at the prison. In an email directed to me, she Like as wrote, in last year? Or, no, this okay. is whenever this article came okay. out. In an email written to me, she wrote, quote, Amber was my daughter, and it was my responsibility to keep her safe. I go over and over those last days in my waking hours and my sleeping ones. I just wish I could do things differently. The story of Tina Resch shows us what can possibly go gruesomely wrong with the American legal system, specifically when the poor are considered. With every step I got further into my research, the surroundings got shadier and shadier. 
After the bad experience with her first lawyer, Tina sought a new one, Philip Carr, for her habeas attempt in which she would fight the legality of her imprisonment. However, this attempt was cut short when that lawyer was accused and sentenced to 25 years in prison for child rape. A third lawyer, who was convinced of her innocence and worked for her for free, died of a heart attack. Oh, my God. I know. I know. I feel so bad for her. Stars are not aligned for this lady. The medical expertise of Dunton, responsible for Amber's autopsy report, became the center of discussion when, in 2001, his diagnosis of shaken baby syndrome as the cause of death of a toddler was refused by the chief medical examiner in the state of Georgia. A second pathologist that was consulting in the case against Tina was recently accused of illegally providing opiates in exchange for sexual favors. Good Lord. The doctor that wrongfully prescribed the the antipsychotics, Dr. Philip C. Aston II, was sentenced to 10 years in prison in 2009 for illegally providing medication. On top of all of this, the judge that sentenced Christina in 2012 had to step down when he was investigated due to to legal misconduct. So it's just like everything that can go wrong is going wrong for you her. You need to bring this case back up for like yes, a motion yeah, of dismissal totally, or something. Totally. They 100% do. And I think they're, I think people are trying to do that. Like you would think the Innocence Project would be all over this. They can't because she did the Alford plea saying oh. she was basically guilty. That's, wow, that's, she really screwed herself with yeah, that. But uh, another thing that I don't think I have written in here was that and this, I hate, that. this sucks, is that that lawyer, when he would like do commercials and his advertisements, would always state that no client of his ever got the death penalty. So he had her specifically do that plea just in case she would get the death penalty because then he couldn't say that anymore that mm. none of us, so she got just royally, his career. royally screwed mm. by him, just unbelievably. On October 1st, 2018, two days after Amber's virtual 30th birthday, I received the news that once again, Tina's parole had been denied because of, quote, insufficient amount of time served to date, given the nature and circumstances of her offenses. She had not yet received the decision letter, and she had to hear it from me over the phone. Ugh, that's just rough. Yeah. Uh, Her sobbing was cut off after five minutes by a computer voice thanking me for the conversation. Jeez. If Tina had been sentenced to death, her chances of release would have been better. In Georgia, amongst other states, various organizations are there that take a stand for the many innocent people on death row. However, those organizations have so much work on their hands that innocent people sentenced to long sentences or even life in prison can rarely be helped unless their innocence can be proven with DNA research. Hmm. Recently, thanks to spontaneous donations by friends and supporters, we have been able to hire a specialist post-conviction parole lawyer. After spending two and a half months over three visits to Georgia in 2018, I will return there in 2019 to continue setting Christina's case in motion. There have also been exploratory talks with the co-producer of a successful podcast and with others in connections of the Atlanta film industry. So they're trying to they're trying to do something to about bring this. light to yep. it. Hmm. So this all this next part comes from a. June 17, 2018, Georgia Star News Online article called, quote, The real story of Christina Resch Boyer. Did a perfect storm of events lead to life imprisonment? And I think it did. The article says, quote, Boyer has strong support on her side with old and new friends who collectively call themselves Team Tina, pushing for someone, anyone, with influence to listen to her story. There are websites about her, some filled with facts and information, some with innuendos, and some with personal opinions that would most likely carry no weight with the Georgia judicial system. There was a book published about her, and a national television dramatization did air. But underneath all of this are a few points of facts about this case that would leave even a skeptical citizen wary of what had happened to this woman, and what would also seem to beg for attention from those who have the power to revisit this case with an open mind to see if an injustice has occurred and then to right it. Possible strikes against Tina's character was the common knowledge of her claim of having telekinetic powers, you know, and mm-hmm. it sucks, but that that went so much against her, especially with right. the faking the poltergeist yeah. activity, mm-hmm. you know. It's interesting how this went from like that's what I said. This one is weird. It went from, it went from paranormal to true crime. Mm-hmm. Like uh, there was also a sexual video the police had that a prior boyfriend had taken of her. A childhood spent in foster homes, the fact that she was an unmarried young mother, and the fact that she was the subject of a book and television show about her telekinetic powers. Perhaps Tina's story has been muddied up with the paranormal claims and the community perception of a young unwed mother. 
the career goals of her attorney and the local sheriff that seemed to conflict with what would have been best for her, which is 100% true Mm -hmm. what happened, possible medical or mental issues, and a media blitz on this sensational murder case that included a national television show, Unsolved Mysteries, and print, which is the book Unleashed, of Poltergeist and Murder. So a perfect storm of events seemed to have occurred with Christina Resch Boyer at the epicenter, but when it's all sifted through, this is the story of a young woman who pleaded and accepted punishment for a murder that happened when she wasn't even present. So. And could they prove that she wasn't there? I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. But I think he said she wasn't there. She said she wasn't there. I'm just assuming she went somewhere that she had people witness that she wasn't there. Uh, ABC News Studio is producing a series of shows on Hulu, and there's a three-part true crime series called Demons and Saviors that is going to look at Christina's case. Hmm. So maybe that will open something up. Right. And I really do want to read this book. It's it's by William Roll. It's it's uh, it's called Unleashed of Poltergeist and Murder: The Curious Story of Tina Resch. Hmm. In his book, Unleashed. Roll insists on her innocence, laying out inconsistencies with the police case, believing in her when no one else would. Until his death in 2012, Roll remained convinced that Tina was innocent of the crime, that she was powerful, and that her poltergeist was real. In the book, he writes, quote, I have been working on Tina's story for 20 years. I still find so much about her mysterious, her origins, the full extent of her abilities, the circumstances surrounding the death of her child. But one thing for me is certain. For a time, Tina had the power to directly affect the physical world. I am convinced that this power is still to be found in the depths of her mind. And lastly, since 2008, she remains in prison to this day, despite the efforts of her supporters. Mm. That's what I got. Yeah, it's a downer. (laughs) It just, it sucks that, like, the poltergeist stuff, I think, like, had a big effect on people. Mm -hmm. So it's like she lied about that. Like, if she's lying about that, she probably killed her baby. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, like, the stuff that sucks is the stuff with the lawyer. Yeah. Like like having her get this plea the person who's supposed just to help for his her. own benefit, yeah. knowing that it's condemning her to a life in prison. Right. You know, I mean, oh, that just... Yeah. I don't want to swear, but I'm just kidding. Yeah. It, I just, I, I hate it that that stuff angry. happens. That stuff yeah. does happen. Mm-hmm. So I know that's a downer, but you know, when I was, that's when I was researching the poltergeist stuff, I came across this and I'm like, oh, like, this has to be a mini mystery mm-hmm. because like, like you said, it goes from a paranormal story into a true crime story. Really sad one. Yeah. So the that whole is, thing is just so sad. Yeah. So I, if she didn't do it, which I really don't think she did, I I hope that there's some sort of justice done for her. So I just feel bad. Yeah. So yeah. Absolutely. Sorry, that's such a sad one, but we I wanted to cover. So that. why was the the husband or they weren't married, right? Why was he in prison? I think for it was like child abuse, but I think it might have been. Amber's Kate situation. I'm not exactly hmm. sure, but he was released back in 2011. Right, or he's whatever. been out, but she's still in prison because she took this Alfred plea. <sighs> so she's got life in prison. Crazy, you know. That's what's messed up about our system. If you realize yeah. somebody's wrongfully imprisoned, yeah. we need to do something. But, but about a lot it. of the stuff I read said they think it's mostly because this guy liked to brag that he never. His none of his clients ever got a death penalty, hmm. and he figured she had a chance of getting it, so he purposely did this so she couldn't get the death penalty it just instead spent life in prison so it sucks i know that's a horrible story but there you go (laughs) sorry to end on a downer yeah that one was rough i'm ready to talk about almost famous (laughs) (laughs) i'm ready to talk about almost famous too um our two stories like i am getting so snotty our two our two song (laughs) suggestions not in a snarky kind of way no but i'm snotty in a snarky way because it just bothers me that that so much of that comes down to the lawyers right. and not so much down to much who did you what. Have, right? Yeah, it comes down to who has the... Like, I'm, I'm following the Kristen Smart mm. murder case. And it's just frustrating. Like, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. I don't... I, the only stuff I know about law I saw on Better Call Saul. <laughs> so I don't really know much, but it's just like, right. it seems like such a messed up system mm-hmm. that it's just so... It's like a game of chess rather it's, than... Yeah. yeah. And it's like, it becomes more the lawyer against lawyer rather than the rights of the people that they're right. standing for. Or the best interest so of the people just, they're standing for, yeah. It just pisses me off, to mm-hmm. be honest. All right. Our song suggestions... 
from strangers, actually. I'm not doing any of this episode. I'm going to do one next episode. I'm going to talk about a show that I just watched that I just absolutely love, but I'm going to save that for next episode. Okay. Our song choices for this time. Our first one is from Andy Pitt. And I don't want people to give him crap for this because I feel like this band gets an unnecessary amount of grief. And that's Nickelback. I knew you were going to say Nickelback. <laughs> because I feel so bad for them because they're like the whipping boy of uh-huh. hated bands. Yeah. But it is the song Rockstar by Nickelback. So is so, the lead so singer of Nickelback and, the guy who married Avril Lavigne? I think so. Okay. Uh, I don't think they're together anymore. She's if like she's engaged. Avril Lavigne even, but that's a Ooh, story that's another for another episode. That's a, but it's a song Rockstar and I listen to it and I'm like, it's good. I hate that I know Nickelback. What song it is. Yeah. I hate that Nickelback get grief. It's so funny that I knew you were going to yeah, say Nickelback. Yeah, because they're like the go-to joke band. And, it, mm-hmm. and I mean, they kind of laugh about it, but it still sucks. Yeah, I know know? what song you're talking about. Yeah, and it's a good song. It really is. So Andy would like the song Rockstar by Nickelback. It's not my cup of tea, but I understand why it appeals to people. Yeah, I do too. And Sophie. Sophie. Sophie would like to do the song Cringe by someone named Matt Mason, who I had never heard of before, but I listened to it. It's actually pretty good. Okay, you're going to post those on the Yeah, I'm going to post those in the Strangers. Sweet. I don't have a listener question, and I don't think we got any new ones. Well, this is going to be a shorty episode. How long is it? We're just under two hours. <laughs> hey, we've been hitting like two and a half hours lately. I'm just, I'm so annoyed about that last case. Yeah. I knew I was going to get annoyed talking about That's that because it just sucks. Yeah. And like, if she is, I, I'm, I don't know that she's innocent. But if right, she but is, she didn't get a fair if she trial. is, her whole life is such a a tragedy yeah like uh yeah. anyway she was doomed from the start i'm just getting annoyed uh and if you think if she had just had a different upbringing had found a different foster family you know what i mean i don't necessarily think her foster family was bad but well it sounded like she suffered abuse though like corporal punishment but i mm-hmm. mean that was spanking and and whatnot I can't get in there right now. So, all the questions. Do we have any questions? Do you have any questions you want to answer? I think we've. No, I don't think so. Should I read a joke? No, but uh, one of their listener questions that I still haven't answered yet was rating, ranking my crushes. Oh. One I want to put out here. <laughs> Crystal, why is Crystal laughing? <laughs> because I I still go back to my Army Hammer episode. And now I watched this Netflix series on how he's like this totally sadistic. We're gonna like, get into this and almost. We're gonna get into this and almost famous. But you know who nobody would ever suspect is like kind of one of my big crushes. Frazura, whatever. No. no, I don't know how to say her name. Nope. Not Kate Hudson. No. Uh. What's that girl's Anna Paquin? No, oh. Frances McDormand. Oh, she no, has, I would never expect She has that. always been like a super weird Not crush. Zoe like, like from far, if there since I saw her in Fargo, she's oh. been like a weird she's crush a on my- She's a great actress. She's a great actress, but I have a crush on her. I always hmm. have. But I'm going to put this one out there for the, for the strangers. I think this one is actually easy. There are two actresses I have a crush on. They both played the same character on a TV show. That's all I'm going to say. I'm going to see if strangers can figure that out. Is it Buffy? No. Oh, okay. Shh, shh. I'm going to let them figure sorry, it out. Sorry. There are two actresses I have crushes on. They both played the same character on a TV show. Okay. So that is a challenge for the strangers. So now you can do your Chuck thing. Norris. My Dayquil is wearing off because yeah, I feel like... Yeah, you're getting very congested. I feel like 10 pounds of poop in a five-pound bag. Oh, dude, they're swearing in here. Don't read the swearing. No, ones. I'm not going to read that one. I'll read it to you when we're not recording. <laughs> when Chuck Norris bleeds... Oak trees sprout up from where the blood fell. <laughs> I'm not going to read the other one because it's swearing. So I'll just, we'll save the n- next page for next time. Read but... that to me when we're done. Okay. In a sexy voice. Oh, okay. <laughs> In your game show host voice. I don't know if I can do a game show host. Oh, maybe I can. <laughs> okay. I'm doubting myself. Is that I'm all selling we... myself short. Is this all we Is that what we got for today? Deets? Yeah. Do you have any deets? I got deets. If you would like to email us, you can email us at thestrainsessions at gmail.com. We are on Twitter at Strange Session without the final S. Krista does a really, really good job on Instagram at the Strange Sessions, and I love our Instagram listeners. Mm-hmm. Sending, Me too. You, sending you non, non, non cold transferring kisses. 
Uh, you can send us postcards and snail mail to The Strain Sessions, P.O. Box 434, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, 54221-0434. And you can call our lonely little phone line at 920-443-9602. And if you have a listener story you would like us to get to in that episode, please send it to us because we love those episodes. Yes. We know you guys love that episode, so that's what I got. Sweet. Is that it? I think that's it. No, I don't, I don't think we forgot anything. I'm sure we did, Probably. but I'll remember it driving home. <laughs> but like I said, next season, I think our mini mysteries are going to be more about haunted locations. Yeah. Uh, if we have like something like a cool mini mystery, we'll try to tie it into an actual episode. I think that's all we got. I am spent. Kurt's ready for a nap. I am ready for a nap. Um, And we still have to talk about Almost Famous. Mm -hmm. So I think that is it for this episode from The Strange Cellar. So from Krista and myself, until next time, stay stay strange. strange.